Hello, this is Jeff Weiss, continuing on the Intro to Hort class uh, with Unit 4A, material about the growth environment in which plants grow and thrive and reproduce and are subject to horticultural manipulations. So some of the key terms and concepts that we'll be getting into this year um, arise from our view of plant the plant environment uh, from an ecosystem uh, standpoint. So we'll be talking about the biotic and the abiotic components of an ecosystem and uh, we'll be talking about some of the uh, science of plants and uh, some of the practical uh, applications of those. So um, we'll keep moving here with the presentation. Upon completion of this unit, um, students should be able to list the important environmental factors, both biotic and abiotic, that affect plant growth and development, and be able to describe the effects of each environmental factor and how that factor can be managed for better plant performance. Um, we are also going to look at uh, the implications of our actions, uh, both from a, uh, a global human impact on the environment and then some of the uh, local actions that we as individuals and as horticulturalists can take to try to um, reduce our adverse impact on the environment. So that's the, um, the point of both the discussion and the assignment for this unit. Some of the biotic factors that affect uh, plant growth and development include um, the effects of other plants and animals and um, broadly speaking that includes other organisms such as uh, bacteria, fungi, and other organisms that are um, that don't neatly fall into either the plant or animal kingdoms. So some of those uh, biotics, some of those organisms are harmful to the plants that we want to uh, grow and produce uh, as horticultural plants. Uh, obviously weeds uh, compete with desirable plants for all of the resources needed to sustain life. Uh, space, sunlight, uh, nutrients, moisture, etc. Um, fighting weeds is a um, big deal in the uh, country and we talked about this uh, a, a bit uh, when we um, presented um, integrated pest management in an earlier lesson. Uh, there's also diseases, uh, fungal, viral, bacterial, pathogens, uh, that cause a uh, negative uh, or a disease response in the plant. And uh, certainly a lot of what uh, horticulturalists do, especially uh, greenhouse nursery operators, um, fruit and vegetable producers, ornamental horticulturalists do is to monitor uh, their plants and to have a suite of preparations and uh, uh, actions to um, combat those diseases. Similarly with pests, there's a variety of insects, uh, mites. Uh, this is a photograph of a mite and uh, uh, they're very uh, numerous and uh, uh, difficult uh, pests to, um, to combat. And uh, depending on whether we're talking about uh, uh, organic or uh, more traditional methods of uh, dealing with these pests, there are a variety of uh, responses that we can take. Then there's um, plant uh, herbivores and parasites. Those are the, uh, uh, the animals and other organisms that munch on our desired plants and uh, uh, they also need to be dealt with. 
Then there's a whole uh, suite of beneficial um, organisms, and some of these are uh, poorly understood or frequently overlooked. And one of the most important of these is the symbiotic uh, fungi uh, that live in association with the roots of most plants. And those fungi uh, perform a, a critical function uh, uh, to help plants get the nutrients that they need out of the soil, especially uh, phosphorus, which is a uh, a secondary but very important nutrient uh, required by all plants. Uh, those fungi uh, spread their mycorrhizae widely through the soil. They scoop up phosphorus and other um, uh, trace uh, nutrients in the soil and make them available to the uh, roots of plants. Um, and in exchange they take um, photosynthates or sugars produced by the plants, but that uh, symbiotic relationship is uh, very important to many or most uh, uh, higher level plants, uh, especially uh, uh, angiosperms. And then I think we're all uh, well aware of the uh, uh, role of uh, uh, honeybees, butterflies, birds, and other uh, organisms as pollinators. In fact, uh, there's been a lot of uh, publicity recently about uh, uh, hive collapse in honeybees and the adverse effects that that is uh, causing to crops of, uh, large crops of uh, plants uh, who depend on uh, honeybees to pollinate them. And then another uh, area of beneficial organisms that sometimes overlooked are the decomposers. And the decomposers in the soil, the worms, the centipedes, the uh, um, bacteria, fungi, other organisms that break down organic material, um, make that material available uh, again to the roots of plants so it can be uh, taken up and recycled and um, used for plant growth and development. Then there's a uh, list of abiotic factors in the plant environment. And um, we've already talked about these when we talked about the growth factors for plants. But we'll quickly review some other aspects that uh, were not covered in the prior lesson. So climate and weather uh, are certainly critical uh, factors in determining which plants um, uh, will grow in, in uh, a desired location. Climate is the combination of temperature, moisture, and sunlight uh, for a given region over a, a, an extended period of time. Uh, so climate is the weather uh, over uh, months or years, uh, probably many years, and uh, weather is the what's going on today. Uh, the combined effect of temperature, precipitation, wind, light, and relative humidity as it pertains to a location at a given point in time. So when we're looking at the weather map on the nightly news, we're looking at what's happening uh, that day or what's forecast to happen within uh, the next few days, while um, climate, as represented by this, uh, this um, hardiness zone map is the uh, result of many years of uh, experience and represents the um, coldest temperatures that are, are recorded for a particular location and at, at a given time of year um, and lets um, this kind of information including the uh, end of the frost uh, period um, allows uh, farmers and horticulturalists to plan on when to plant uh, their uh, cl crops each growing season. Um, there's a lot of other information uh, about climate and weather. We won't get very deep into that, but we'll talk about a couple of these topics in subsequent slides. So the air uh, all around us uh, uh, has some important characteristics uh, that it um, that are relevant to uh, 
horticulture. First of all is the temperature, the amount of heat held in the air. Uh, we know about the um, uh, minimum temperature and the effect on um, hardiness zones, uh, but also the maximum temperature and the amount of sustained heat in, a, in an area also uh, enable or uh, limit certain plants from growing in an area. Relative humidity is the uh, water content of air. Um, humidity affects the rate of evapotranspiration, that is the amount of water uh, able to be emitted by the leaves of plants. And in a very high humidity situation, the amount of evapotranspiration that can occur uh, through the plant leaves is um, severely restricted. So um, many times on hot, humid days, you'll look at uh, 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 plants and they'll look to be under stress. And that stress looks similar um, whether the uh, plant is uh, wilting or um, stressed by too much humidity in the air. In either case, uh, the plant is unable to uh, conduct photosynthesis efficiently because of the amount of uh, moisture in the air. Air pollution occurs as a result of uh, toxins, ozone smog, or other um, chemicals in the air. An important chemical uh, uh, is the amount of uh, nitrogen or uh, ammonium, which is a nitrogen uh, compound. And uh, nitrogen is actually kicked up from um, uh, feedlots, places where thousands of cattle or chickens or turkeys or um, uh, other animals are maintained outdoors in a concentrated environment. And that uh, uh, nitrogen that is uh, brought up uh, into the wind is deposited downwind from the, uh, from the feedlot and actually uh, causes both benefits. It reduces the amount of fertilizer that a farmer has to add to uh, the land. Uh, but it also uh, is a contributor to um, pollution in streams and lakes. And acid rain is a particular kind of um, pollution that occurs when sulfuric acid and nitric, nitrogen oxides react with water in the atmosphere. Um, those uh, uh, materials uh, result in very low um, pH uh, acidity. Uh, which is uh, then deposited on the ground or in the water uh, and has been shown to be uh, very harmful, especially in um, mountain lakes uh, in the northeastern U.S. and Canada. Some of these lakes have been totally uh, uh, sterilized. Uh, all life has been uh, poisoned uh, because of high levels of acid rain. So um, the effects of um, the, uh, what's going on in the air are important for plants and uh, the human imprint on the land through our, uh, uh, the way we raise animals, uh, our use of um, fossil fuels to drive our cars, our cities, our factories um, have impacts and, and uh, that's the subject of the assignment and um, a starting point for the discussion for this week, or was for last week, rather. Um, water, critically important element of the plant environment uh, required for germination, photosynthesis, and transport of materials through the plant. Uh, moisture stress, uh, too low levels uh, can result from transpiration. Um, where the plant is taking uh, the water out of the soil at, to the point where there's not uh, enough left to sustain the plant, and um, evaporation from the soil uh, into the air uh, will cause the same impact. Um, as this lecture is recorded, we are just coming out of a little mini drought in the middle of September in Illinois, 
and uh, many of the plants that were so healthy through this uh, wet growing season have become stressed just in the last uh, few weeks of dry weather, dry hot weather. So that um, stress is caused by a combination of the water that's in the soil just uh, evaporating into the air and a very significant amount of that water also being pulled up into plants and being released through the leaves in the course of um, photosynthesis and, and transpiration. So it's this combination of factors, uh, heat, humidity, um, temperature, uh, moisture, precipitation, uh, that determine what kind of um, plants and what kind of ecosystem will um, result in a particular area. This chart um, puts together uh, the humidity, the, am the amount of precipitation, uh, the latitude, the, the distance north and south of the equator, and then the altitude, certainly uh, how high above sea level influences the, both the temperature and in important ways uh, also determines the uh, amount of uh, rainfall. So what we see around the world are these different uh, ecosystem or um, biomes as they're called and they range from uh, desert to um, rainforest um, with a little bit of everything else in between. And the important thing about this is that um, even though these um, ecosystems are determined by natural conditions, they can be affected by human activity. One obvious example that comes to mind is the golf courses, the green uh, turf grass golf courses that flourish in uh, Las Vegas and other uh, dry areas in the south, southwestern U.S. only because of extensive watering. So water is pulled, uh, scarce water is pulled out of wells or out of reservoirs, sprinkled onto uh, uh, grass in the middle of the desert to support these little green oases. Um, is this practice sustainable? Um, don't know, but the water resources in most of the western states in the U.S. are under extreme pressure, and uh, uh, better horticultural practices are indicated if the uh, um, the populations and the um, agriculture in those areas is going to be sustained over the long term. Just one example, but uh, you can probably think of other examples in our own region where um, landscapers and homeowners are frequently testing the limits of our climate and our soils by planting uh, exotic species that uh, are uh, likely to um, struggle or struggle to survive or just not be able, be able to survive in our our environment. So uh, plants are, are brought in from further south or from high elevations. Uh, uh, blue spruce is uh, one example of a, of, a, uh, of a plant that's very, very common uh, but um, likely struggles when introduced into um, our area. And you can uh, think of your own examples of uh, manipulations um, in the conditions um, that are attempted, some successful, some not, in order to promote uh, uh, landscaping or other horticultural goals. So this issue of water is important. It's a critical resource. Um, and I think uh, I've already showed this slide, or something close to it. But um, uh, yeah, any... Uh, amount of moisture uh, deficit or use of um, water that exceeds the amount falling from the sky uh, in rain and snow uh, will result in over time um, moisture stress and loss of water as a resource. 
Uh, we're fortunate in the Midwest uh, to have uh, uh, huge, uh, well, plentiful rainfall most of the time, and also the resource of groundwater and the Great Lakes uh, nearby. Uh, but you can see here on this map that across the world, most of uh, the United States, and in fact most of the world across the tropics, and a lot of the temperate zone, it does suffer from uh, water stress. It's a critical resource uh, that affects the livelihoods and lives of billions of people on our planet. Moving along to temperature, um, temperature regulates uh, all physiological processes. So chemical reactions uh, that occur in cells and uh, in uh, organisms can only take place um, within a certain range and they are most efficient uh, at a much smaller range. So uh, this plant growth curve uh, looks at uh, the percent of production uh, that occurs in plants uh, during each month of the year and you can see that the uh, growth uh, spikes in the uh, warm season months of May, June, July, August and then uh, drops uh, drops off rapidly uh, through September. And that's a, um, a result of, of both uh, temperature and sunlight. Um, but uh, it's very uh, typical for uh, for what we see in our in our uh, region. Then uh, temperature stress is uh, due to very high temperatures um, at some uh, temperature something over 110, 120 degrees. Uh, photosynthesis. Uh, stops and uh, uh, sustained temperatures at those levels kill the cells and the plant will rapidly die. Uh, dormancy, um, um, especially uh, plants that are native to our region, um, many of those plants um, have a strategy uh, to um, protect their seeds from immediately germinating uh, just as uh, winter is beginning. So those plants uh, require uh, a period of low temperature um, before the um, seed will uh, will successfully germinate, and that um, there's a, a manipulation that I will be talking about later. It's called cold stratification, where seeds are exposed to um, storage in a um, moist sand in a refrigerator uh, for several months after which they'll be ready to germinate. However, if uh, seeds are stored, seeds that require um, uh, low, moist, low temperatures and moist conditions to, um, to germinate are stored dry indoors uh, over the winter and planted out in spring, they will not germinate at all that year. So the idea of, of dormancy requirements is really a fascinating subject and different plants have evolved different strategies for protecting their seeds uh, and trying to assure that they will germinate under the most uh, advantageous conditions to to grow and continue the species. A heat unit is a measure of plant development based on minimum or maximum temperatures needed for growth of a certain plant and some um, uh, plants uh, decide when to flower and set seed based on a certain number of heat units. Others of, of them uh, use uh, photo period which is the number of hours of uh, daylight and sunlight in order to um, um, reach the condition where they go into flower. But um, these are all um, uh, evolved um, reactions and uh, uh, 
characteristics that plants use in order to um, use the uh, resources available in their environment or in their ecosystem most effectively. So cool and warm season plants, um, those growth curves that I talked about uh, vary across the year. The upper uh, curve uh, with the rapid growth in April and the peak in May uh, is for from a cold season plant. Uh, some of the prairie plants that are uh, that are, are cool season. Um, uh, well, I guess I should go to uh, some general examples. Uh, so the, some of the cool season plants that you find in your garden are the lettuces, the uh, uh, cabbage, broccoli, um, bok choy, and um, things like carrots and beets. Usually the instructions on the seed pack are to plant as in the spring as soon as the soil can be uh, can be uh, manipulated. And other plants are uh, held back for later planting. The beans, tomatoes, squash, uh, many other familiar plants are uh, warm season plants where their growth occurs in the uh, after the soil has warmed up and uh, as the uh, late s uh, spring and summer t temperatures rise. So the, the curve in the growth over the growing season is dramatically different for these uh, co cool season versus the warm season uh, plants. Light. Uh, light uh, varies, um, has some important qualities. Um, it's not just how much sunlight uh, is uh, received by the plant, although the intensity of the sunlight, and it is highest at, uh, in, in midday, obviously, is an important uh, aspect of light. The quality relates to the wavelength, and uh, light is most strongly absorbed in the blue and the red uh, uh, part of the visible light spectrum. And the reason why we see uh, green when we look at plant leaves is that plants really don't like green light. They reflect it. So that's why we see the green color when we're looking at uh, most plant leaves. The daily duration, I mentioned this earlier, is the photo period. It varies. Um, different plants require different photo periods, uh, and there's a short day, long day photo periods, uh, and plants uh, that are either uh, intermediate or uh, are day neutral. In other words, uh, they develop uh, during the growing season without regard to uh, whether there's uh, a short days, um, spring turning to summer, long days, mid-season, or um, fall season when the day length is uh, decreasing day by day. Uh, one of the best examples of photo period is um, poinsettia, which is a huge uh, uh, greenhouse crop um, and has the Christmas season as its big sale season. So greenhouses are um, lit up during the night to provide the photo period requirements for uh, poinsettia when they're uh, being prepared for production in the northern hemisphere. So what happens? Too much light? Um, plants that are adapted to grow in full or partial shade can get too much light and they show a symptom of leaf scorch when they are uh, burned by too much uh, sunlight. On the other hand, uh, plants that are um, uh, shaded um, show symptoms of etoliation. This is the yellowing and the stretching of inner nodes as plants try to uh, stretch out and reach for um, more light to uh, increase their photosynthesis. Plants are adapted to a specific level of light, and um, I think we all know that some plants are sun-loving, where they want to be in full sun all the time, or shade-tolerant, where they um, uh, grow well in shady conditions or even are uh, injured if they get direct sunlight. 
So the next uh, topic that we're going to cover in the plant environment is soil. Uh, soil provides, uh, this is a cross-section of uh, plants and soil called a soil profile in the photo. And soil provides for both the physical support and a reservoir of nutrients and moisture to support plant growth. So the soil profile is divided up into horizons uh, going across a vertical cross-section. Uh, an O-layer has loose and partly decayed organic matter. It's still recognizable as um, leaves or stalks or stems and hasn't really been mixed up and become part of the soil. Um, if you've been in a in a woods uh, in fall and you've seen the uh, uh, layer of leaf called leaf litter scattered on the ground, then you've experienced the O horizon in soil. Uh, below that horizon uh, is uh, the A horizon, uh, minerals mixed with a lot of that organic material uh, from the prior year's um, leaf fall. Um, the A horizon in Illinois is uh, deep because of the heritage from uh, the prairie. Our prairie plants with the deep uh, root systems produce some of the deepest, richest topsoil in the world. The E horizon is where the um, uh, topsoil begins to mix with the material at the bottom of the soil profile. And uh, the A horizon has minerals, uh, I'm sorry, the E horizon is most often found in, again, in woodlands. It's a light colored zone where uh, uh, material has leached down. Uh, some of the organic material has leached or um, been brought down by water into the lower uh, levels. Um, and it, it shades out or grades out into the B horizon, uh, which has usually, uh, in our area, accumulations of clay, uh, materials from above, uh, but also mixes with the uh, parent material from below. Uh, the sea horizon has uh, partially altered parent material. Uh, since uh, most of our area was glaciated 10,000 years ago, uh, we see a lot of areas with sand and gravel or deposits of clay that were left behind by the glaciers. and. Uh, it's in that B layer that those materials are mixed with the parent material down below. And this uh, diagram also gives you a, an idea of what the relative uh, depths are, these various horizons. Um, the A horizon, uh, a good uh, topsoil might be 10 inches, uh, but could be much deeper. Uh, the subsoil or B horizon might be an additional 30 inches, and then uh, down below uh, the parent material might might uh, extend far down into the soil, uh, into the ground, uh, especially if it's a, a rocky um, uh, surface. It, it may go thousands of feet uh, once the uh, D horizon is reached. But soil is created from above, from the additions of um, material from plants and the atmosphere, and it's created from below by the slow breakdown of the parent material by water, temperature, and other uh, soil building uh, factors that occur. Soil science is cool. Take, uh, take a class in soil uh, soils if you get a chance. So the uh, properties of soils include um, the texture and structure. Uh, soil texture is based on the composition of the soil, and there's three uh, par particle types, uh, clay, silt, and sand, uh, that are found in different proportions that determine the texture of a soil. So if a, if a soil is 60% or more clay, uh, it's a pure clay soil, uh, represented by the yellow um, area at the top of the pyramid. 
if uh, soil has even as little as um, um, well, if the soil has as 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 uh, little as ninety percent sand, it's considered a, a sand soil. Uh, whereas, uh, similarly, ninety percent uh, silt, which is uh, the common material from uh, riverbeds and uh, uh, other uh, water-based um, uh, ecosystems, uh, it, you'll have a silt soil. However, everything else, everything else in the middle of this pyramid is based on a mixture of those three particles. And uh, most of the soils uh, that are good for horticulture or agriculture are these loams um, at various points in the middle of the triangle. And each of them has um, pros and cons as to how um, beneficial they are for horticulture um, and which kinds of crops will thrive best on them. But the uh, uh, soil structure um, then is the arrangement of these various particles into um, uh, bigger particles or aggregates of different shapes or sizes also called the crumb texture. So that when you um, um, dig up the soil or even walk on the soil, uh, you will notice that there is a, uh, a look and feel uh, that's uh, determined by the uh, soil particles that are uh, uh, that make up the texture. Um, in your uh, videos for this week, uh, there's a, a, a a video that shows how to uh, determine uh, the texture uh, using what's called the ribbon test and that there's a photo of uh, a hand uh, starting to do the ribbon test so I urge you to look at that and uh, try that out yourself see what kind of soil you have in your garden or your or your backyard by uh, using the ribbon test Then there's a lot of other uh, chemical soil properties and the chemical soil properties have to do with which uh, nutrients um, and minerals are, are to be found in that soil. Uh, one example of, the, of this is cation exchange uh, and cations are the uh, uh, minerals uh, that are held in particles of clay especially uh, and uh, nutrients like sodium or potassium are uh, held in clay particles and are uh, important to the uh, development and uh, growth of plants. Whereas uh, sandy soils um, are usually very poor in holding uh, holding nutrients so if you have if you're trying to grow plants in a sandy soil you are probably going to have to fertilize or add organic matter to that soil in order to uh, sustain um, healthy plant production so we're going into um, the nutrients that plants require for their growth and development and of course they need to get those primarily from the soil so um, each uh, of these nutrients is required in some degree by plants and with them they will grow green and healthy without them each um, plant will show symptoms of nutrient deficiency and here's a couple of examples of uh, deficiencies in first in nitrogen, then in uh, phosphorus, and finally in potassium. And uh, the ability of a horticulturalist to diagnose these problems uh, will allow the right um, fertilizer or uh, soil amendments to be added to create a healthy, uh, uh, a healthy soil that will uh, support a good crop of whatever is being grown. So the primary nutrients are nitrogen, N, 
uh, used in plants for the synthesis of proteins and amino acids. Um, nitrogen promotes uh, strong green vegetative growth and is particularly important nutrient for uh, turf grass. Phosphorus, on the other hand, is critical for the energy transfer process. It's found in um, DNA, RNA, the amino, uh, the proteins and amino acids, and it uh, in, in, induces root growth and crop maturity. So when plant is ready to um, go into fruit and seed, uh, then it is drawing on reserves of phosphorus and requires. Uh, may require phosphorus feeding at that time. However, phosphorus is really a, a, a trace uh, element and most of our soils in um, Illinois are rich in phosphorus. So it's not really a nutrient that is required in most soils. Uh, in fact, there's probably too much uh, phosphorus being used in phosphorus fertilizer, uh, which is resulting in a lot of the pollution and algae problems that we're experiencing uh, locally, and especially in the Gulf of Mexico, um, uh, which is uh, being caused by fertilizer um, inputs and in farms, especially in the Midwest, being uh, carried down in the waters of the Mississippi River out into the Gulf of Mexico, where they cause these um, huge algae blooms and when the algae die they suck the uh, oxygen out of the water they float to the bottom and then the um, resulting water is um, basically uh, has no oxygen and is uh, therefore um, toxic to fish and other uh, organisms so long story short about phosphorus it's a uh, critical um, uh, requirement for plants, um, but its overuse in fertilizer has is having severe um, bad consequences uh, both in the U.S. and around the world. Finally, potassium is a catalyst for enzyme uh, reactions. Uh, it's needed for protein synthesis and storage of starches uh, and production of marismatic tissue. These are the primary nutrients, and um, there are numerous uh, secondary and micronutrients. Calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are the secondaries. And then there's a list of uh, about eight or nine more um, trace elements required. And then finally, the remaining components of plant and animal tissue are the hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon that are provided from the atmosphere. Collectively, these elements are the elements of life, and any of the other non-green elements on this table uh, don't belong in any plant tissues. Green is in uh, used by organisms. Everything else is either not used or more likely is toxic uh, if plants or animals are exposed to them. Next topic is soil pH. Uh, soil pH is the amount of the acidity or alkalinity in soil. Um, low is uh, pH is on a scale of uh, 0 to 14. Uh, 0 is the most acidic, 14 is the most alkaline, and 7 is neutral. Uh, generally, uh, healthy soil uh, is slightly uh, acidic. And um, this chart shows um, the tolerance of various uh, organisms or the activity of various uh, nutrients depending on pH. So um, fungi will uh, survive in all pH categories. Um, Phosphorus has a uh, band where it's uh, active between about 5 and 7 pH, and um, that corresponds with the appetite of most plants. Most plants need phosphorus, as mentioned earlier. Um, most plants, uh, 
especially garden plants, uh, fruits and vegetables thrive best in a uh, pH range of 5 to 7. Although there's examples, um, pines and azaleas thrive on, uh, on low pH and there's other plants that will tolerate a more alkaline soil. Organic matter in the soil, uh, this is the product of breakdown of uh, uh, plant and animal um, litter on the ground. Uh, use of organic matter is a natural means to add nutrients and improve the soil texture, the moisture retention and drainage, especially in uh, heavy clay and uh, sandy soils. Um, organic matter is uh, what will hold the nutrients and hold the moisture in those uh, difficult soils. Um, organic matter is mostly decomposed plant material so it already has the right balance of nutrients from the uh, from the plants that uh, that broke down to make it and also organic matter promotes uh, a, a healthy level of beneficial soil microorganisms so um, when to add fertilizer well I guess it depends on whether you're an organic uh, uh, farmer organic gardener or not but if you add uh, chemical fertilizers uh, what you need to understand is that they primarily uh, have uh, three components uh, nitrogen phosphorus and potassium and you can read the bag um, nitrogen is the first number phosphorus is the second and potassium is the third and in general, because there is so much uh, phosphorus in our soil in Illinois, uh, you can generally purchase uh, fertilizers uh, with uh, a zero in the middle number and not have to uh, worry too much about your plants getting enough phosphorus. So soil fertility is widely misunderstood and often misrepresented. And it's misrepresented um, by I'll just put the cards out on the table, are misrepresented by uh, big fertilizer and chemical companies who want to sell more fertilizer. Uh, so adding chemical fertilizers is the standard approach to um, in our traditional uh, agriculture system to uh, increasing the crop size, but it's not always the most beneficial approach. It's not always needed, it's not always cost effective or sustainable. And in fact, uh, what some of our soils in Illinois are um, showing is that the more fertilizer that's added to the soil, the more that's needed in subsequent years to maintain the same level of crop production. So it may be that a vicious cycle is, uh, is uh, developing here where uh, more fertilizer is required each year to produce the same crop. Um, and uh, a law of diminishing returns may be set in. We'll talk more about this when we get to organic farming and uh, sustainable farming uh, units later on in this course. Um, just another note on soil moisture. Um, there's three categories of uh, water uh, in the soil. Uh, the first category is gravitational water. This is the water in the soil right after a rainfall. The water is saturated or you may see pools of water on the top and um, as that water drains out of the soil uh, it leaves behind uh, openings or pores uh, where, uh, where uh, gas, oxygen, and, and CO2 can, uh, can fill those pores. Uh, but while it's there, uh, uh, plant roots can take it up and take it up very easily out of the soil. And when it's drained, it leaves behind um, just capillary uh, water. And that capillary water is held in the soil by um, attraction of soil particles. And plants can also uh, easily use capillary water. 
However, when the capillary water is gone, there's still water in the soil. It's called um, hygroscopic. And that water is very, very tightly held uh, by chemical bonds with soil particles. And that hygroscopic soil uh, water is not available to uh, plant roots. So even uh, though your soil may be may show some signs of uh, moisture when you turn it over. If that water is nothing but hygroscopic, your plants will uh, quickly wilt and need watering. And that's what we saw recently during this mini drought is that uh, the plants and evaporation had exhausted um, the uh, water in the soil and um, were starting to show uh, some very significant signs of stress or wilting. So moisture availability and loss relate strongly to soil type. Sandy soils drain quickly and lose their moisture. Clay soils retain water and silt is uh, between the two. However, the other thing to note about uh, clay is that while it retains water, it also retains more of this hygroscopic uh, water uh, that is really not uh, uh, useful for, uh, usable by plants. So I mentioned about pore space and there's two points to be made about that, at least for this course, is that pore spaces or healthy soils have large pore spaces. In fact, um, an undisturbed healthy soil uh, might have 45% uh, minerals, mineral matter and have enough uh, pore space inside to hold 55% um, other things. 25% water, 25% air, and 5% organic matter. Um, so um, a nice uh, light soil um, allows uh, plants to set their roots uh, to get the needed uh, water and minerals out of the out of that soil uh, and to be uh, very healthy um, for all of the uh, purposes of that soil. When a soil gets compacted either by um, too much trampling or even worse by uh, frequent uh, vehicular traffic, whether those vehicles are uh, uh, plows or tractors or trucks or what have you, um, much or most of that pore space is lost. So uh, an example of a compacted soil is shown here where it's 74 now 74 percent mineral matter and uh, only uh, has space for 18 percent water, uh, 6 percent uh, gases, and 2 percent organic matter. Uh, that is not a healthy situation for the plants who are trying to uh, put their roots into that soil or um, for the materials that the, in addition to the uh, mineral soil that the plants need in order to develop and grow. So that is the point of this is that it's very important to um, be careful um, when walking on your soil or even um, the location of a path through a forest can uh, have a significant adverse effect uh, on the roots of uh, trees. And even we see in urban trees that are located too close to driveways and sidewalks and roads that those plants, uh, those trees are not healthy. And the reason why is probably because the soil is compacted. So that's the end of this unit. I hope it was helpful. Um, please um, continue your good work with discussions and um, let me know if you have any questions about this week's assignment. It's due instead of an assignment. Um, the exam for this week is due instead of an assignment on Saturday. Let me know if you have any questions or um, uh, issues that will prevent you from completing it on time. It is an open book exam and um, I wish you good luck with it.